Hello. Uh, you should be able to hear us. Welcome. Or, yeah, welcome back. So, we're here with Sebastian von Altman, who is, what was your title? It was just pasted. Development uh, Manager. A development Manager for a group who is uh, basically managing the computing environment on our supercomputers. Right. So, Sebastian is here to talk about um, the different types of services available at CSC. So it's not only bigger than what we have at Alto in terms of the computers, but also there's a lot more different types of services, which are very useful to certain types of projects. So with that said, I'll switch to his screen. Yep. And um, please go ahead. Okay. Hello, everybody. So hopefully you can see my slides, I assume. So so this talk really is about uh, presenting some of the things we do at CSC, what kind of services we have. And I'll, I have tried to put a lot of links into various interesting training material or, or places where you can find further information. So this is sort of like a overview about who we are, what we have, and how you basically can start to use the things that we uh, offer. And what is CSC? So CSC is a non-profit company and we provide all kinds of IT services for research and higher education. CSC has originally sort of been formed around providing supercomputing resources, but now we have a lot of other things also, but still supercomputing is uh, sort of a core thing we also provide to users. And we own by the ministry, but then also all higher education institutes like the ALTA, for example. And uh, what may interest you is that for most for researchers, most of our services are free of charge. So on our web page, you can find a sort of document also detailing that. But basically, if you need compute storage for research projects, that is all free of charge and, and paid for by the ministry to enable enable you to sort of do your research and really move forward. And uh, when might you need CSC? So if you compare that to a laptop, that's one thing. So like if you re if you need something more in terms of computation, your calculation takes a very long time. You need to would like to run it in parallel. You would like to learn many of your sort of computations at the same time. That that would be an excellent use case. Or you just need a lot of memory or a lot of storage space. And uh, of course, all time and the other universities also provide some clusters and. Uh, those are also feasible, so you may want to step through those and then move to CSC where you need something even greater. But CSC is also meant not only for really large computations, it's also meant for smaller usage. So you should not feel uh, worried that your use case is, is too small. At the end of this presentation, we will talk a bit about how you get access in practice. Uh, another thing that we offer at CSC, so we really try to not only provide uh, like core compute service and data, but also have a lot of documentation and training and also quite a lot of pre-installed applications on a supercomputer, really to make it easy to take them in use. Of course, many users also want to compile their own applications or, or some custom, custom things there, but if you need something uh, something off the shelf, something quite standard, and that is all available there, like Gromax or, or many other uh, applications. On our documentation pages, docs, CSC, FI, you will actually find a detailed list about all the supported applications. Also, our Alto, uh, or this Alas, I mean, uh, uh, storage system can be interesting when you want to store data and publish it to the internet for like a sort of limited kind of lifetime. And, and that can be quite useful. So what, how does this different for a university cluster? I think mainly it's in, in scale. So on Mahti we have 200,000 cores and on, on Puhti 30,000 CPU cores and then we around 400 GPUs in total in these systems. And on Mahti you can run very large simulations up to 25,000 cores. On uh, Puhti, there's also quite large limits, but not quite as large because we, we sort of emphasize more on Mahti really large runs and then on Puhti more of the sort of smaller runs. Lumi that I will mention, this is a really huge thing in Finland. So Lumi is the new 
UHPC pre-execute system that is being installed in Kajani. And that will provide a really large amount of GPUs. And if your code is able to use GPUs, that's excellent. Probably you would like to use GPUs, so you can use Lumi because it will really provide a lot of a lot of capability. And uh, I can mention here that Lumi inauguration is next Monday. So if you go to our web pages, you will find a link where you can look at all of that over the internet also. Otherwise, if you compare it, I think there are many similar things. So our supercomputers also use a batch queue system, Slurm, and modules. So it will be a bit familiar. I already mentioned this. So Puhti is, uh, we have two supercomputers. They are uh, very similar in terms of how you use them, but there are some differences. So Puhti in general has a lot more software. And in particular, different kinds of software that use a single core or just a little bit of resources that is IO intensive. Those are really the kind of things that we have installed in Puhti. There's a number of different kinds of nodes in Puhti, some with large memory, many with smaller memories. There's also a lot of uh, nodes with local disk, which can be really useful for uh, jobs that, use a, that do heavy IO. And uh, that is a key thing that, that we are also trying to encourage our users to use. There's also a sizable GPU partition of Puhti with in total 320 GPUs. So for AI, if you really need to do heavy AI work, that is the main platform right now, I would say, here in Finland for academic work. Of course, once we have Lumi in place, then that will, that will change. And then Mahti, that's our sort of largest supercomputer, about 180,000 cores in total, and also nowadays a GPU partition with these newer Ampere GPUs. So those provide you with the, still the latest and greatest NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, which should you use? It depends a bit of what you want to target. If you want to have the much wider sort of uh, set of software, then probably Puhti. And if you only need to use a bit of CPU cores, like single CPU cores and so on, you need don't books, R studio, so on, then that is the, the machine to choose. If your jobs pay each individual job that you want to run uses a full node at least, so 128 cores, and you sort of need to scale to larger, larger sort of number of nodes, then Mahti is the platform of, of choice. So single core things is not really something that you would run a Mahti, but more on Mahti. Also, the software, uh, amount of software is, is smaller, but there still is a, a lot of software that we feel sort of fits, fits this profile. Often in Mahti, what we see is that many users also compile their own applications. And there's also, of course, many cases where basically either system would be quite feasible. If you want to run really large simulations, so this is over 2,560 2, cores, then you need to prove the scalability and that you can do through our MyCSC portal that you also use basically to manage your projects and, and manage your user account. One new thing also why you may want to use Puhti or, or I think in general if you're a new user or even a power user and, and you want to make your life easier in some cases then I think you should take a look at this web interface that we introduced last autumn in October and it has actually gone through many iterations. We're now in ver version 8. And it provides a, a portal where you can, in your web browser, access Puhti. You can browse your files, you know, if you want to quickly sort of browse in a graphical fashion through your folders. That can be quite nice. And sometimes you can open files easily from there. Like if you have a PDF, you can double click and open it in a web browser, these kind of use cases. You can also look at what jobs you have running. But in particular, I think the strength is in making it easier to launch various interactive applications like Jupyter Notebooks, RStudio uh, sessions or TensorBoard and these kind of things. So that is the main use case. If you look at our users, Jupyter and RStudio are by far the biggest or most common applications we use through this one. Visual Studio Code is also interesting. So we have a number of users that are really using that daily for their coding work. So you can launch up a graphical uh, coding 
IDE where you can do all of your work on Puhti. Also, a nice thing in, 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 in this open on demand is that you can quite easily, or in this web portal is, you can quite easily launch graphical desktops. So we nowadays have two different desktops available. One sort of a normal VNC desktop running on a normal compute node where you can do things which are not uh, graphically intensive in terms of 3D acceleration. Now there's also another one, which is actually running on uh, these physical GPUs, where you can do heavy duty visualization tasks. So if you want to run Paraview, Visit, BMD, or some other visualization tool from pre or post processing uh, tool, then you can use that one. So we have a number of applications which are integrated there. And, and if you have a need and something is missing, then please send us like a ticket or through our ticketing system or the service desk. And then we can see if we can get that installed also. So that's actually quite quite cool, I think. Also, uh, one there's a number of what was a potentially interesting use cases also, I think, for these graphical desktops. For example, if you launch a graphical desktop, you can easily share a link to other users so that you can have the session where you sort of do all the work, but you can share a link where they can actually join in the web browser and look at what you're doing directly. So that I think could be interesting for some. Uh, teaching or collaboration tasks. Also, if you want to do a course, so actually education is a allowed use case on Pulti also. So we also now have Jupyter Notebook environment in this web portal where you can create a custom environment. It's that is that you can easily launch through that, that environment. So training in general has been quite common there. I should mention, we will bring this also to Mahti in the near future. So soon you'll be able to do the same things there too. Lumi, I think you're all very interested in Lumi. And Lumi, of course, is a really huge thing for Finland in general. So it's if, if uh, CSS resources are bigger than what is available at the universities, then Lumi is like much greater still than what the, the sort of CSC national supercomputers provide. It's a system also based in Kajaani, hosted by us, and it's owned then by this UHPC joint undertaking. And uh, basically the service is provided by UHPC, CSC, together with the consortium of 10 countries providing doing that are this Lumi consortium. And for Finnish users, about 25% of all of Lumi's capacity like 35 percent is reserved for Finnish users so that's a really huge amount of resources in total there are over there are a bit over 2500 GPU nodes on Lumi and on these nodes there are four uh, GPU GPUs sort of installed and if you then log in actually use them you will realize that these are dual die GPUs so they are sort of uh, on the logical level you see eight GPUs per node so from a user perspective, it's actually even 20,000 GPUs there. So it's a really, really large jump compared to what we have right now. Uh, there's also a CPU partition available. It's smallish, but not that small. It's actually a bit larger than Mahti, but not much larger. And there you can also run CPU things. And this is already available, though we a long uh, service break did start recently. So it will be available again in July. But you don't actually need to wait for the GPU partition to be available to get a taste for what Lumi is. You can already now log in to the CPU partition and, and check things out. And in the Lumi in the Lumi ecosystem, there's also a lot of other things that that will come up over the years. So, for example, there will be a Kubernetes platform available hopefully next year, and then there's also a, one partition focusing on ROS pre-processing and post-processing where there's uh, nodes with a lot of memory and also there's a total of 64 gpus just for visualization tasks now uh programming program for csc supercomputers is pretty much the same as any other supercomputer we try to sort of support a very wide wide range of, of various options. So of course, Python and R are really huge on uh, like Puhti, for example, there's a lot of uh, machine learning tasks going on or, or different kinds of frameworks that are developed in these that are, are being executed. 
for more traditional HPCC and Fortran also very valid things. Uh, parallelization techniques to multiple nodes are, are, are still normally like MPI and OpenMP that I think you already covered in this course here. For GPU programming, it gets a bit interesting, of course. So uh, one difficult part with Lumi is that because it's an AMD GPU, not an NVIDIA GPU, you cannot actually directly run CUDA code on that system. So how do you get access? How can you use the NVIDIA GPUs or the AMD GPUs on Lumi? One option is that if your application you're using already is ported, then that work will be done for you. You will either find a module there, or uh, the Lumi user support team will provide this uh, recipe that you can use to compile your own, to compile this application on Lumi. So then, then we can sort of get you help, help, help you from there. If if this is your own code done with CUDA, for example, then there are still ways of doing that, and we have a lot of, we have training material and so on that can help you get started. But the short story is that you need to port it to AMD. And basically, what the main sort of program model for AMD GPUs is HIP, which is very, very similar to CUDA. So there's actually automatic translation tools that we take your CUDA code and make it into HIP code. It's basically very close to just replacing all occurrences of CUDA with HIP. So in many cases, if the CUDA code is fairly standard and not very complex, or even in the complex cases, you get very far with this automatic tool and just need to fix a few small few some some small things. For machine learning, we will also provide on Lumi also a set of different kinds of uh, environments, and that is also available on 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 Uhti and Mahti, of course. So one key thing when you start to use a supercomputer, if you use the laptop, you can notice that some things are not as fast as you expected. Because it's not always trivial. You can hit a lot of bottlenecks. Like in traditional simulations, you talk a lot about like scaling. So you know how well does your MPI code scale to many nodes. But often then when people run more like Python and R Studio things or, or just this more like a lot of jobs or, or some workflows you see start to see that there's going kind to of be also other bottlenecks that really start to hinder you so slurm is one so if there's some some users want to run a huge amount of jobs or huge amount of tasks then you will notice that slurm itself you cannot launch ho however many jobs you want it's not really designed for that so that can be one limitation so you need to basically within one slurm job do more uh, tasks instead io can be another bottleneck so especially under national systems, because we don't have a very fast flash file system in those, then if you do a lot of metadata operations, so file open, closes, these kind of things, or if you do a lot of like small IO, you know, write randomly a few bytes here and a few bytes there, it can get very slow. So in all of those cases, we really recommend that if you at all can try to use the NVMe, because this can be a lot slower than what you would expect. Because after all, on a fast modern laptop, you have actually a local NVMe, which provides a lot of performance. And also, of course, also on the <clears throat> compute side, there can be various, various things that can hinder your performance. And here's a few links, I think, that can be quite good for you. So this first one is a self-learning course, where, there's, where we cover a lot of different topics on how you can use our environment efficiently. And it actually starts really from the basic usage of our environment and also then goes to even slightly more complex and, and uh, complex things and it's sort of built around this so uh, built on top of a lot of tutorials we have built up over the years another page i would like to highlight from our user documentation that's actually a bit related to the lecture you had before this and this is about if you uh, it's about helping you to find the correct tools or correct methods for running a large number of jobs. So let's say you could either it can be that you have like a, this uh, just want to run a sample something and you have want to run a large number of jobs, sampling some phase space, changing some parameter, or it can be something more complex where you have many tasks depending on each other and so on. 
So it's about finding the correct way to do IO, the correct way, what are the correct workflow uh, tools or, or sort of frameworks you want to use, and then provide links to so that you can actually take these and use the our systems efficiently. And if you do machine learning, you may want to take a look at the at the, this the other tutorial. Uh, we don't only have supercomputers, we also have cloud services. So we have CPOTA, which is a, like a general computing cloud where you can launch instances. So you can launch virtual machines where you can then uh, on a Linux platform, then install a lot of different applications and, and run, run various software. This could be useful if you want to have a web port or, or perhaps even in some cases for, for computing. Though the sort of compute or the resource available in our cloud is much less than in the in supercomputer. So if you want to do compute, then use the supercomputer if, if at all possible. Then there's an ePoto, which is for sensitive data. But uh, if as an individual researcher, it's very hard you, to get access unless your uh, organization already is in, uses ePoto. And Rahti is an OpenShift container cloud where you can then run containers. This is built on top of CPOTA, and uh, that is this kind of a modern Kubernetes-like cloud. Uh, sensitive data was mentioned. Unfortunately, here I'm sort of missing a link. So actually, now CSC has spent a lot of effort also to develop our sensitive data services. So there's a whole bunch of sensitive data services, and perhaps I could mention SD Desktop as one that you may be interested in. So that is actually one way in, in which you can use ePOTA if your organization is not already a member of the of this service. So in that you can get the you can basically launch uh, uh, this VNC desktop running on a, in a secure environment and do computation on sensitive data within this desktop. Basically computation that is uh, fits into into this one virtual machine model. We are also developing methods for how you could then actually use Puhti uh, from this SD desktop to also you do sensitive data on HPC resources. This is something that we hope to bring into use uh, next winter. Here are some details. I will not go through this in, 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 uh, in detail, but uh, I think that you can see some main differences between Puhti and Mahti. Puhti is based on Intel. And uh, it has a wide range of different kinds of memories and NVMe disks. So that's really the sort of key characteristics. It's also based on Infima HDR, but slightly lower bandwidth than in, in, in uh, Mahti. And here are also the 80 GPU nodes, which are which we sometimes call this Puhti AI partition. Mahti 1404 CPU nodes with these uh, AMD Rome CPU CPUs, 2.6 gigahertz. All of the nodes have 256 gigabytes of memory. So if you need a lot of memory, then you should use boot. And there's also 24 GPU nodes on this system with Ampere. So basically AI workloads can be done on either boot and Mahti equally well. We have a, also a good set of AI or machine learning uh, frameworks installed here. Lumi, some details there. So I mentioned this. So this is the brand new MI250X GPU. And uh, this will be available at the end of the year or towards the end of the year next autumn. Some of you may have seen that uh, approximately one week ago, the latest list of fastest supercomputer was released. And in that list, uh, sort of uh, partial Lumi, so only 40% of those GPU nodes uh, uh, was tested with the benchmark that is used for this list, Linpack. And Lumi was actually third fastest supercomputer in the whole world in this list. So I think that's quite an achievement. And another thing I think one should also keep in mind when comparing this to our national system. So it has a very large or pretty large flash luster system. So for some IO intensive workloads, this can also be quite interesting. Those workloads where you want to use multiple nodes there's a local NVMe is not enough. Or in simply, if you want even more performance than you can get from those local NVMe's. For uh, data management, we had uh, even groups and units doing different kind of uh, creating services for, for data. One key service for us is Alas, 
So this is a Ceph-based object storage that you can access from your laptop directly or from Puhti and Mahti or the cloud. And it's like the central storage area in, in at CSC. So the uh, Lustre file systems on Puhti and Mahti only meant for temporary storing files, but here you can store the data for the sort of lifetime of a project. There's also other services, for example, EDA service that CSC provides to universities, where, where, which is really for this kind of fair data with metadata. That where you can publish data for for a longer time, and different kinds of also metadata services for finding data from EDA and other 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 fair data services. We do training. I will have a few links later on, and we do a lot of expert service. So if you as a user need help, then we it's very easy to approach CSC. First, perhaps look at what we have in our documentation because we, because we have a lot of documentation. And then you can just send an email to the service desk and, and get help. Here are a list of the topical training. So this really basic introduction to what supercomputing is, is this first one. That is something you can send to your grandmother, basically. And then we have these uh, different portals linked where you can find a lot of different trainings. Our training is all in the CSE training portal. Then there's also LUMI training portal where you will find our training, but also training from the other LUMI partner countries. And then finally, at the end, there's also this UHPC Competence Center, which is this uh, Europe-wide, really huge project, which tries to increase HPC competences. And there is a portal where you can find training from all the different UHPC Competence Center countries in Europe. And since now a lot of training has become this kind of e-learning, remote learning, I think a lot of those courses can be quite accessible from here, even without traveling. And CSE also has, after COVID or because of COVID, uh, really focused also more on self-learning materials. So you can find some links there to a lot of uh, different courses which have, which you can use for self-learning. So how do you get access? It's quite easy. You go to mycsc.fi, and there, if you have Hakka application, and if you are a student or a staff at universities, then you do have that one. So you can log in with that and use that as your identity and then get a CSC user account. And I should mention that both Lumi and these national resources of Puhti Mahti Pota are available from there. And to be able to use like Puhti and Mahti, you do need a computing project. And for that, you need somebody who can be the PI. So if you're a really fresh summer student, then you yourself cannot actually be the PI. But you simply need a ex more experienced researcher, like a postdoc or professor even, who can be the PI and create the project and then invite you to this project. And then you can get resources. And the project manager can then apply for billing units. So billing units are basically the, how you pay for our resources. So in these free of charge use cases, you get, get those by applying for them. You ex depending on how much you want, you get it very easily, or then you need to write some more motivation why you need this many building units. And here are some final links. So if you want support, send an email to service desk and you, we will then connect you with, uh, with the best expert. In our documentation, there's also tips for how to write a good ticket to get, provide all the required information. Because of course, even though we have good expert, they cannot read your mind. So they only know what you've write in the ticket. Lumi user support also can be reached if you want to use Lumi. So it's sort of do not send those tickets to service desk at CSC, but use the web form that you can find from that page. In that way, then it will reach the correct people. It, it may even end up on our table at CSC, but, but that is still the, the sort of correct way. Then we have user documentation to user guide. It's very extensive. And uh, if you look at how I have overview about the, all the services, then research CSFI is the, the good place to go. Thank you. Any questions? I should check, I guess. And so, so one of the questions was just why, why AMD, not NVIDIA, not the Lumi computers? Well, if you buy a supercomputer, it's not like you just select something that you want and you buy it. It's always a sort of a competitive bid where you basically provide benchmark and, and other sort of metrics for selecting a good computer. And different uh, companies that sell supercomputers then 
they'll, they'll, they'll what, sort of promise what they can provide and then different technologies compete. So basically it was a competition between NVIDIA and AMD. And depending when you install it, then different companies will perhaps have more, how should I say, uh, well, more competitive technology, depending on pricing also. And at the moment, that is by far the fastest, fastest uh, GPU in the world. And you can see that by the fact that mm -hmm. the fastest new supercomputer in the same list I mentioned is also exactly or very similar architecture, same GPU, same CPU, so on. Yeah, there was also a question about uh, can you use your own software or software that is like private in there? Uh, I responded there already that you pr get your own work folder when you apply for this. Yeah. Um, apply for these projects so like like the triton cluster and all of the other clusters they're shared systems so uh, in order to make certain that uh, like data if they you have private data or something like that uh, you will always get your own project folders and you yeah not everything is readable for everybody yeah so so like uh so that's how lumi and Puhti and Mahti work so basically all users you have a small home folder where only you can read the data, but it's not really meant for computing anything. And it's very small, so it will not fit much there anyway. But then you have this uh, both Troy Apple folders per project for uh, for your programs and then the sort of scratch folder for data. And, and those are then per project. So all users in the project can be, are supposed to share this. Of course, actually, you can, of course, change the user rights. Only one user can see some some folder if required, but that sometimes causes issues also. Mm. Because if that person so, leaves, then nobody can access that files. But still, for sensitive data, that is enough, because this is uh, for those who, for really sensitive data, like some clinical data, then, then you should compute that on a more secure system. And for that, we are developing the sensitive data services. So there was also a question, <clears throat> uh, like, can you achieve this with Docker containers? So. Uh, like us, use seem to use a lot of singularity containers in the cluster, and I noticed in the workflows uh, there was a really nice, nice slides there also about containerizing uh, con container environments and all kinds of like fancy tricks that to make stuff work faster. So mm -hmm. uh, it seems that the, the, these tools are getting more and more popular. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, like a basic uh, uh, this kind of. Um basic docker container gonna be run right now because uh, that would require root or some other tricks that we haven't enabled so right now if you want to use a docker container you need to first uh, transform it into a singularity container and that sort of works almost always uh and yeah there's a i think this uh, workflow uh, page that we did is quite nice and this tukku tool is also very interesting and if you and I really would suggest that if you want to do a Conda installation, don't do a Conda installation on disk. It's really, really slow. And we at CSE don't like it. So it's like in nobody's interest. But we have this Tukku tool, freely available on GitHub also, so you could install it in Triton. That really makes it easy to, to, to package up a Conda installation inside a container. So you don't need to go build a container anywhere or anything like that. It, it basically uses a pre-made container and then uh, on the side installs your Conda environment. So it's quite easy to use, very easy to use. We have had many not very not quite non-technical users also taking that new use. So you can quite easily then uh, put this complex Python installation in there. Yeah, I highly recommend checking all of the documentation. There's lots of uh, very nice advanced stuff there. Like, well, what would you say like um, if, um, uh if if now the users uh, if they are now starting only the hpc journey and they're only start now starting working with the local clusters so would you say what would you say would be the next step for our users to take if they are in were interested uh about the csc system should they like immediately go knock on the professor's doors and ask for a project or uh or what or read the documentation or what would you recommend as the first st step towards using csc machines yeah I, I would in general like recommend not to have like sometimes people perhaps have even are even too afraid to start to use csc so uh, get a small project on 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 puhti probably 
you need, you know, a professor or some postdoc, but if I get a small project there, with a small project, you probably cannot break very many things. Read the documentation though, and, 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 and see how it works. And I think especially this web portal can be quite interesting also if you're sort of a new user. So, and, or if you're a Windows user and don't have SSH installed, then that's quite practical also. So, yeah, we have lots of, yeah, like uh, us local uh, clusters, we have lots of collaboration with CSC. So for example, nowadays we are working on implementing, for example, the open on demand system that CSC has taken into production into into our local cluster and and some of our singularity tools have found their ways their ways into CSC and and uh, like this is ongoing uh, like collaboration between the systems and the systems like there are differences of course like because who who makes the systems and and what are the what what kind of philosophies are underneath and stuff like that but general things are quite similar like like what uh, Sebastian mentioned about uh, queues, Slurm queue system and the Lustre file system and and uh, similar kinds of like nodes and it's it's they are yeah the the differences are smaller than the com like things that uh, that like are shared between these kinds of clusters. So usually, like if you if you find yourself at home at at let's say a local cluster, you can easily jump to the CSC world. And, and start working there. And, and like, uh, exactly. And, and I have to say that, that like now, if you now start with HPC, then this is like the golden age of Finnish HPC. We have never had more resources in Finland available for computational research with the national systems being pretty new, but also with Lumi coming in. So this is really like, <laughs> it, it, like, resources will not be the limiting factor for you. There can be other limiting factors, yeah, like software that works there and, and so on. But like in terms of resources, it's never been a better situation than now. Yeah, so don't don't be worried worried about like 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 am I allowed to use these few CPU hours somewhere? Like there's probably going to be a lot of uh, CPU hours like available for every researcher in Finland. If they yep. just utilize them, yeah. Okay. Do we have? Uh, I don't think we have questions in the chat. Yeah, it looks like it's all answered. So should we thank Sebastian and carry on with the last section? Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thanks for Thank coming. You. Thanks for the discussion. Bye. Bye. Bye.